Welcome to, uh, well, first of all, my name is Brian Peterson. I am a life coach with Achieve, Grow, Succeed Coaching. And I wanna welcome you on behalf of the Pay It Forward platform here at Life Coach University, where coaches from around the world have gathered to help coach millions more. That's our mission on there. Uh, we just want you to join us in paying it forward and help us create the biggest ripple effect of gift giving the world has ever seen. And it all starts with each one of us in our own communities, in our own homes. Um, all that we ask is that you pay it forward in some way, shape, or form. My favorite is to ask you to actually use the coaching, pay it forward to yourself first, uh, use that coaching so that you could help others. You could teach it to others. You could share Life Coach University, share this opportunity with people. All of this is free on here. Um, and then uh, my favorite are just, you can give somebody a hug. You can make somebody laugh. That's one of my favorites. We don't care. Just join us in making this the type of world that we want to live in, which is one filled with more joy, peace, love, and meaningful connection. Um, Thank you for being you. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, even if this is, you're not joining us live and you're joining us down the road, you're simply amazing. Uh, and before we dive in, I want to give another shout out to our YES program. What is our YES program? It's our Youth Educational Scholarship. Um, and if any of you are joining us in for that today, I want to honor you uh, for wanting to improve yourself. I promise you that today's uh, masterclass or today's lesson uh, on building your mental muscles will greatly help you with achieving success in the future, achieving, creating the empowering life that you want to live, right? I promise you that it's going to help. Uh, congratulations. We are currently, the, the YES program is currently in a summer holiday. We've had some amazing individuals that participate in the program uh, and gotten certain their certificates. I just wanted to give a shout out on behalf of Life Coach University. We're super proud of you. Congratulations. For any of you that want to join, we will be starting up again in September. And the only requirement, get this, the only requirement is that you watch an hour class each week. That's it. It's all you have to do. Uh, who is the YES scholarship for? The Youth Educational Scholarship. It's for 19 to 25 year olds. It's free. It's a scholarship. There's no application. All you have to do is email uh, the office at hello at life universe. Ah. Email the office at hello at lifecoachuniversity.com and say that you're interested and they'll get you all the information that you need. Once again, uh, we start up in September. And in the meantime, you can go on there. There's all kinds of classes on there. Uh, you could check out all the classes that are already listed. Uh, I know I've done one uh, on habit building on there. There's one on self-esteem on there that, that I've done personally that I know of that are just amazing. So anyway, uh, once again, my name is Brian Peterson. I am a life coach with Achieve, Grow, Succeed Coaching, where I help people uninstall their limiting beliefs in self-sabotaging ways and install a success system of thinking instead. And I help people create results in their life where they're struggling. So that's what I do. Uh, and now let me go ahead and give me just a moment because I don't need that anymore. I need that one. So today's topic is what are your mental muscles and how do we exercise them? Um, this is, a, it's not necessarily a new concept, um, but oh, before we dive, dive in too, is uh, if you have any questions on here, there is a Q&A box in there. Just put your question in the Q&A box. Um, <clears throat> I'm going ad lib today. So normally I've got uh, usually designed uh, stops where I stop and, and I have people ask questions but I'm kind of going off the cuff today because this is just something that I love to talk about and I figured I could just talk about it forever. Um, but anyway, so if you have any questions, just put them in the Q&A box and I will get to them uh, right away or as soon as possible when I feel like it's a good time to, to stop on there. So thank you. So let's dive in. What are your mental muscles and how do we exercise them? This was a fascinating thing for me because <clears throat> when, if you look up, if you Google or use whatever search engine 
did you like to use and look up mental muscles what comes up um frequently on there because i've looked it up they're gonna it's gonna say things like uh goal setting or confidence or discipline and things like that right and i was like how is how is that really like a mental muscle and if it is let, let's say goals or if it is discipline like how do i exercise that how do i i get in there and so in my search for it <clears throat> what i did is is when i started my business five years ago is I started taking all these actions to create this business. When I got done with my, my schooling, um, I had taken an online course that took me over a year. Uh, and one of the classes said uh, how to get your business going. And so I started doing all these things. I found myself um, not following through a lot. I found myself just, um, I would go hard for like a couple of weeks and then it would either taper off or I would just hit a wall and quit. And this happened with all kinds of other things too, like with exercising or other things that I was trying to do to improve my life. And I thought, I've got to solve this. And so I started reading books and I thought, okay, well, it's got to be procrastination, right? I'm just not doing it. I can't get myself to do it. It's got to be procrastination. So I started reading books on procrastination, anything that I could get my hands on. And I started doing all the tips, hints, tricks, and band-aids that they offered. And some of them work to various degrees, but I still would get to that taper off where I would stop doing it again, or sometimes I would just hit that wall. And I'm like, well, that's not it. Maybe it's my motivation. And so I started reading books on, on motivation and how to build your motivation, because that is actually like your motivation is kind of finite, but there's ways of building it, right? And that didn't really work. I mean, it did to a certain extent, but once again, kind of mediocre results. So then I got into willpower. It's got to be my willpower. I, I need to willpower my way through. That one really didn't work. It's got to be my time management next. So I started reading books on time management. I need to time block or I need to, you know, get rid of all the electronic devices, shut off my email and all these things that are bothering me or whatever that are interrupting my thing. And I need to just block off time and stuff that had mediocre results and so i just i was so frustrated and i remember thinking to myself i would sit there and ruminate and just go what is it brian like what is it you've had so much success i i was in the restaurant industry for 30 plus years but i abused alcohol and drugs the entire time and this is what instigated the change what did that where I positioned and moved myself into life coaching because I wanted something else that was going to be more fulfilling. I didn't want to do the, the drugs and alcohol anymore, but I had so much success while I was doing it. I thought, well, you know, hell, when I get sober, so to speak, I'm going to have amazing results. And it, it didn't happen. I was like, oh my God, this is even worse. And I was like, what is it? Like, I know I've achieved great things. Why am I not able to get myself to push through to do these things? In one moment, one day, in a moment of clarity, it came to me. I was focusing on everything outside, external, of trying to control this, this um, uh, the results, so to speak, and stuff and how to get them. And then I realized it was like, it was my mind. It was my mindset. Like my mind wasn't strong enough to follow through my mind, my mental muscles. And it also, it had started because I bought um, <clears throat> a program or something from Jim Quick. He does a lot on memory recall and mindset. And he had a picture of this brain that had arms coming out of it with these huge muscles. And I was like, it was, it's my mental muscles and they're weak. And so I was like, then I just set out. I just started reading all kinds of books on the brain, the biology of the brain, um, you know, how do thoughts work, you know, my thinking and stuff like that. I learned about the behavioral loop, like how we operate as humans and stuff like this. All of this was designed to just get me to get my business going. And lo and behold, it became my business. And this is what I actually teach. And this is what I actually do in my program is I teach people how to exercise their mental muscles. And funny, funnily enough, funnily, I don't know if that's a word, but anyway, uh, I remember sitting in front of the mirror, just practicing different ways of telling people what I do. You know, I help businesses uh, get more sales. I help people lose weight. I help blah, 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 do all this. And I was just rattling it off. And one of them was like, I create an exercise program for your mind, for your brain. And it stuck. 
And I loved telling people that. And so that's what I used a lot of times. I create an exercise program for your mind, but I couldn't explain it. And so then I just started diving in. I was like, how, what are mental muscles besides goal setting, discipline, and confidence, right? What are the mental muscles and how can I exercise them? So what I've created is like the foundational mental muscles that you need to get better at goal setting, to get better at discipline, to get better confidence and those things. And then I figured out ways of exercising them. So what I did is I basically just took these concepts that were already out there and all these personal development books and I turned them into a muscle. I said, if this were a muscle and it were a mental muscle, how can I exercise it? So that's what I'm going to share with you today. Uh, do we have any questions before we dive in? Let's give you a couple moments here. I'm looking forward to one of my cats coming out. They always, what Aria always comes out and, and crosses the uh, couch back there. Okay. So that's what we're going to be talking about. I'm going to give you five of the mental muscles today. This is actually going to be a multiple part series where over the next course of the next couple of months. So for any of you in the YES scholarship, this is going to be on continuing and ongoing. I'm going to give you the five of the muscles today, uh, but I want to list off uh, the, the muscles <laughs> and think of these as like concepts, but it's actually a mental muscle that we can physically exercise like I just I, I like to picture my brain in there just like lifting weights doing these curls and stuff right back there okay so the what we'll go over today is awareness celebrations evaluations self-compassion and promises <clears throat> in the upcoming weeks some of the uh, other muscles that we'll be going over are acceptance gratitude letting go um uh, your emotional IQ, uh, how to process your emotions. I combine that all into one muscle, uh, but there's various uh, aspects to that. Uh, how to fill your own cup. Um, I, I made that into a muscle. Uh, decisions, making decisions is actually a muscle. Like uh, my favorite is like, how many people are like, where do you want to go to eat today? I don't know. Where do you want to go to eat today? It's because you, there's a really a thing called decision fatigue out there. So decision making is a muscle. Uh, challenging your thoughts, that's a muscle. And I'm gonna get into the behavioral cycle here in a sec. Uh, and we'll go into that belief building, storytelling, excuses versus solutions. That's another favorite muscle of mine. Um, uh, visualizing, uh, that's a muscle. Um, gain versus gap, looking at how far you've come versus how far you haven't gone, that's a muscle. Another one that I borrowed from uh, somebody in this uh, coaching community I am is called it's take the garbage out first or take the trash out first. Uh, and that means just get started. Everything's going to be garbage at first. Uh, facing your fears. Uh, FOPO. So we've got uh, FOMO, fear of missing out. But I created one called FOPO is forget other people's opinions. So those are some of the muscles that we'll be going over. <clears throat> but I want to dive into I'm a huge believer in why. So why do we need to exercise our mental muscles? And so what I'm going to share with you right now is our behavioral loop, how it works, how we operate as human beings, how we emotionally hijack ourselves, and why procrastination is actually normal. Uh, and I want to share with you with that, because once you understand this behavioral loop, you're going to understand and uh, why you need to be able to get inside of there and have strong mental muscles so you can break into that loop and actually control that loop so that you're doing things that are moving you in the direction that you wanna go rather than, um, uh, it's like living a life by design instead of a, a, a life by default, right? Okay, so how does the behavioral work loop? So basically, uh, some people call this the cybernetic loop. Uh, one of the groups I'm in calls it the model. Um, that's what uh, she refers to it as, but there's all kinds of ways um, you could look at it, but it's basically our circumstances, whatever our environment around us uh, that we take in with all of our six senses. And I say six senses, but the sixth one being intuition, because I believe that we, our gut feeling uh, sends signals to us 
as well. So all of our sight, sound, taste, uh, touch, feel, smells, all of that is coming at us, right? We have 400 billion things that are coming at us at once. And then once we, we check it out, we have thoughts about it. Like I could look at this desk and go, wow, this, this desk is messy. I need to clean this desk up. That's a thought. But I, I didn't have that thought until I saw the environment, until I actually saw the circumstance in front of me. So there's circumstances, and that creates a thought. And then all of our thoughts are designed to create a feeling within us. So uh, what happens is as soon as I think maybe this desk is messy, I need to clean it up, I might feel um, either excited or in most cases, like in my case, I might get a little overwhelmed uh, thinking about it. Like when you think about your to-do list for all the things that you have to do uh, for your schooling uh, or to get your business going, if that's what you're here for, or if you've got kids, all the things that you've got to do for the day in your house or everything like that, you might think of that list. And as soon as you think of it, it might create overwhelm within you. But the word emotion, um, the root word of it is actually to move. So our emotions are designed to get us a move. So now we have the circumstance. It creates a thought in our head and that thought creates a feeling. And that feeling is actually a chemical that's running throughout your body. So that thought that you just had actually chemicals, it changes it into chemicals. And those chemicals are in the form of like guilt, shame, happiness, joy, you know, all those things start to course throughout your body. Well, our emotions were designed to get us to move. Like even way back in Neanderthal time, they were designed to get us to do something. And in this case, like if you're overwhelmed, what do you do? Maybe you, you freeze right? Or maybe you don't do anything or like anxiety, you know, maybe you get anxious. And so instead of uh, doing the work in front of you, you might avoid it and let's say watch Netflix, right? But that's an action. So our feelings cause us to take action. And then we all know that actions create results, right? Everybody says it's actions create results. In fact, there's so many people out there that say that the way to success is just by taking massive action. And I like to go a little bit higher up into that loop and say that it's actually our thoughts that are creating our results, not our actions creating our results, because our thoughts are creating the feeling that is designed to make us move. So it's our thoughts that do this, right? So that's how the behavioral loop works. I'll, I'll repeat it once again, because that's a lot to take in. Our uh, circumstances around us, our environment causes us to think something, that thought creates a feeling in our body, that feeling makes us do something, take some sort of action, and that action uh, gets in a result, right? So why am I sharing that? Like, why is it important to know the behavioral loop? Because 95% of our day is spent on autopilot. And what do I mean by autopilot? <clears throat> the way you, uh, you, you wake up, generally around the same time every day. You get out of bed the same way every day. Maybe you check your phone first and then maybe your routine is generally the same. Maybe you go to the bathroom first. You brush your teeth the same way. You use the same hand. You put your toothpaste on the same way. This is a physical habit behavior. In fact, a lot of times you're not even thinking while you're doing it because it's been, it's like your default programming is what I like to tell people. <clears throat> you dry off the same way after you get out of the shower. Think about it. Like I get out and I take the towel and I dry my face off and then my head, neck, and I get out and then I, but I do all that. I do it in the same way every way. So the same way that our physical habits are on. Um, or another way too is think about uh, either driving to work or driving to the store. How many times have you driven somewhere that you've driven so many different times and think to yourself, I don't remember the last couple of minutes. Like on the way home, that's why more accidents happen within a mile on the way home is because your brain just goes on autopilot. It knows that once it hits a certain intersection, it's just right or left, left, right, left, right, and then I'm home, right? And you just stop thinking about it. I can't tell you how many times I pulled into a parking space and thought, oh my God, I don't remember the last two minutes. That's autopilot. In fact, the first thing that always goes through my head was like, did I almost get in an accident? Did I cause anything? Did I was, did I miss a car that was coming at me or did I run a red light? You know, those type of things, right? So that's autopilot. 
in the same way that our physical behaviors are on autopilot, so is the way that we think. And that's what we're talking about today, our mental muscles. Like the way we react to situations. Let's say a car cuts you off in traffic. Is your reaction, initial reaction to say, hey, you bleepity bleep jerk, you know, whatever. Um, that's the way you think. You think, man, that guy is rude. That guy is whatever. We have thoughts, these automatic thoughts. If somebody yells at you, what are your first thoughts? Um, whenever you uh, uh, see the, the same situation over and over again, you've conditioned yourself to think a certain way, right? Movies are really good at eliciting uh, these types of uh, behaviors that are like your brain doesn't know the difference between something that's imagined and something that's real. That's why when you're watching a movie, which clearly isn't real, but you still feel scared anyway, it's creating these thoughts like, oh my God, what's going to happen next? You know, is that killer? You know, blah, blah, blah. And so we get scared. So our thoughts are on autopilot. And these thoughts come in the form of Two different shapes. I either call them limiting beliefs, things that limit our behavior, that cause us to not feel good about ourselves, or powerful beliefs, things that we, we feel about the circumstances or environment that empower us, right? And it's the limiting beliefs that we need to overcome, and we need to do that by exercising our mental muscles, right? So another way in which um, uh, your that behavioral loop works that we need to do to intervene and, and have strong mental muscles is that we get emotionally hijacked. And this is the reason why I tell people that procrastination is normal. Like we're literally designed to procrastinate. And this goes all the way back to like Neanderthal, eh, Neanderthal times when man was, you know, running around trying to get food, uh, shelter and uh, avoid things like the saber tooth tiger, right? So what was going on in that time is we developed a system of detecting danger and that's still around today. We don't have saber tooth tigers to avoid today, but that system that is looking for danger is still in place and it emotionally hijacks us. And how does that work? So all that information that's coming in every second, that 400 billion things gets filtered through what I call the uh, reticular activating system again. And that's, it just, it filters out certain things. Uh, think of those like sunglasses where it filters that part of the sun and that just gives you the information. Well, that information is then sent to your thalamus. And then from the thalamus, it goes to the neocortex, which is great because that's the frontal lobe part of our brain where we get to actually think about things. Like I get to look around and go, oh, wow, that bookcase, uh, I need to clean it. And I haven't, I've been putting books back in in wrong positions. So I need to clean it, but I actually get to think about it, which is great because that's how we evolve. That's how we do everything is we get to think about it. But the problem with that for Neanderthal man was if there's a saber tooth tiger coming at him and he's sitting there thinking, wow, is that, that's a tiger. Ooh, that's, those are big teeth. Those are big. Ah! And next thing you know, the saber tooth tiger is killing him. Right? So we had to have a way of, um, uh, of uh, informing ourselves if something was dangerous. And so this process happens immediately. So when that information comes in, it goes to your thalamus, at the same time that it's going to your neocortex for you to think about, it sends an immediately quick shortened version of it to your amygdala. And I want you to think of your, the amygdala as like the guard dog or the sentinel that's all that information that's coming in, it's sifting through it all and it does it lightning fast and it's sifting it for danger. It's just saying, is, is this going to be harmful to me? Is this something that I'm afraid of? Is this something that uh, might hurt me or whatever? And if the answer is yes to any one of those, it pulls this alarm signal and it literally hijacks the brain, it tripwires, and it takes control of your brain. And that's what happens when we're procrastinating. Like if we see something that causes anxiety, like our to-do list or whatever, like I know I've got to give a speech or something, or like I've got to do one of these presentations I might get like overwhelmed or I might get panicked or whatever. And then from there, we know through the behavioral loop, I take certain actions. And often during these times, during these procrastination moments, we take actions that we don't want to. And so that's why we need to jump in while we're emotionally hijacking ourselves in the middle of that behavioral loop so that we can control our actions in the loop. 
So I know that was a lot to digest and that was a lot to go over before we actually get into the meta mental muscles. But I wanted to set the foundation so that you actually understood what is going on and you understand the why. So I'm gonna pause for a moment here and see if anybody's got any questions. Okay, give it just a couple more moments in case somebody's typing. <clears throat> Sweet. So let's get into the actual mental muscles themselves. And during this one, I'm just gonna be going over five of them. Um, with the awareness muscle being the granddaddy of them all, the big kahuna, the big one, like it all starts with your awareness. And there's different types of awareness that we can have out there. We could, we could have situational or circumstance aware or environment, like we're aware of what's going on in our environment. I could look around, I could see all these things, like there's stuff that I gotta clean up over there. Uh, I've got some dishes to do, uh, I could, just aware of what's going on in my environment. Uh, I've got the air conditioner, the portable air conditioner set really low, so it's getting warm in here. I'm aware of that. But there's also aware of what's going on uh, with the other senses. How do I feel? <clears throat> like what's going in the mode? What's, how am I feeling inside of my body right now? What's going on with that? Um, and then there's also awareness of your thoughts. Like what am I thinking? And that's what I wanna challenge you to get into that behavioral loop where th your thoughts create feelings that create res uh, uh, actions that create results. We need to start tapping into our thoughts. So how do we exercise our awareness muscle? Um, I read a book called Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess by Dr. Caroline Leaf, and she had a phenomenal way of doing it. She actually measured how long it biologically takes to grow a neuron, which is like a brain cell. And think of that neuron, excuse me, as like a, to create a belief or a thought and to cultivate it. It takes like 21 days and it goes to the cycle. And so what she did is and she, uh, in that book, she basically says to, to set like seven different reminders throughout the day and or alarms or whatever. I have some of my clients, you could just put post-it notes around the house, just reminding you to pause and, and take a moment to think. And I'm gonna tell you how to do it once you hit that pause. For some of my clients that are busy in offices or they work on computers a lot, they reset uh, a lot of their passwords for reminders uh, to get them to focus on their awareness or whatever other muscle or intention they are setting for the day. So she has you do these seven reminders a day. So imagine this, seven times a day, you're reminding yourself, teaching your brain what to focus on teaching your brain what's important to filter in out of those 400 billion things. In this case, it's gonna be awareness. So it's like seven times a day, you're like, you're going to the gym, the, the mental gym, and you're just, you're exercising your awareness. And I recommend in the beginning too, I've noticed this when I first started taking clients through this, but seven times a day is a lot to do at first. So just start with like two or three. You can do it like first thing in the morning when you wake up and right before you go to bed. Those are two easy reminders. Uh, you can, you know, stack it behind other habits. Like after I brush my teeth, I'm going to pause. Or after I do something, I'm going to pause. Uh, you could do it that way too. So just do two or three. You can stop at lunchtime uh, in the middle of the afternoon or whatever you have lunch and do it then. But work your way up to where you've got about seven times that you're doing it. And so every time that alarm or that reminder kicks in, you just ask yourself, what's going on? Like, what's going on in my environment? How am I feeling right now? Am I anxious? Am I overwhelmed? Do I feel powerful? Am, am I excited? Am I happy? And then remember, there's thoughts that create those feelings. So what am I thinking? What am I thinking that's causing me to feel powerful right now? Or what's, what am I thinking that's causing me to be overwhelmed? And so we're just aware of it. We don't have to take any actions yet. It's just increasing that awareness. Like what's going on in my environment? What's going on around me? What's, what's going on in this moment? And then you could do what I do as well. When I do my pauses is whatever the focus is, my intention, I, I, I ask myself, 
between the last alarm and now, were there any opportunities that I missed to notice whatever my intention was? So you could do that and just increase your awareness on that. And along with what's going on in the moment, you can also ask yourself what's coming up in the afternoon or later on that I need to be aware of. And I can set the intention for my brain just to be aware that when that comes around, I can either write myself another reminder. But these are all ways that you can exercise your awareness. Another way is using meditations uh, and visualization. Like meditations are great because they just, you're just there with your thoughts. Most, of, most people, I, I think that when it comes to meditation, they think that they picture a, a, a monk sitting there, you know, uh, in the cross-legged pose uh, and nothing's going on. Like they've cleared their brain of thoughts and they're just sitting there calm as can be. Well, that's not actually true. They're actually just processing their thoughts. And they often say to think of your thoughts as like just clouds that are just floating by. So just use your awareness. So you can meditate. There's all kinds of things. You can get all kinds of books on there uh, on meditation or uh, how to exercise your awareness. But the best way that I found is simply setting those alarms and then just in the moment. And when you get up to seven times a day, you're, I mean, I, by the end of a week of seven times a day, you're going to be, man, I am on top of this. Like it's such an amazing tool. I didn't just use it. Uh, Carolyn Leaf says that if you do it for a 21 day cycle and just like inst instilling one belief or one thought and you focus on that thought 21 days in a row, it actually takes two more cycles of 21 days of reaffirming that thought before it becomes an actual belief. So she says basically 63 days then you get to instill a new belief, which when it comes to that behavioral loop, and the automatic programs that are running are automatic thoughts. Think about that. Like if I just spent, um, just worked on uh, two to three thoughts every day, I could instill after 63 days, I could have all these new powerful beliefs that I could have instilled into my psyche, right? So that's awareness. Like this is the one that, that you're going to exercise the most. Everything, every one of these other muscles, every one of these other things, you're going to need your awareness muscle. Um, to help out with. So that's going to become the strongest muscle. <clears throat> that's like the foundation. And remember before I said the mental muscles like that the internet tells you about the goal setting, the discipline and the confidence and things like that. These are all the foundational muscles. Like we're creating this, like I always think of a pyramid when I'm building up these, these mental muscles and on the very bottom floor are the five that I'm teaching you today. Right. And so we build this huge solid foundation that's rock solid. And so when we step up onto that, we're ready for the next layer. So the next one up is celebration. And you're probably asking me, Brian, why are we celebrating? What's celebration? Why is that a muscle? Why is it even, you know? Because we only do things for two reasons in this world. Like human beings were really, really simple. We do things to either avoid pain or to gain pleasure. And that's it. Like every one of our actions are designed to do that. Like when we're procrastinating or anxiety, we're avoiding pain, some sort of anxious moment in that. Or like uh, you're, if you're eating food, you know, you're hungry and that feels good for you or whatever. So if we do not learn to celebrate, like everybody's always taught like, hey, when you finish that goal, when you uh, finish your project or whatever, but after we finish, and that's when you celebrate. And I'm here to say, no, you need to celebrate the entire way, right? If there's five steps to the project that takes you three days to do, then you're going to celebrate five different times. Because like, think about this, like when you're looking at your to-do list for the day, and you know that you're probably not going to get everything done on that to-do list. So at the end of the day, your brain's going to be telling you, you got nothing really to celebrate, Brian. You only did part of that to-do list. It's not even worth celebrating. Your brain's going to start and your mind's going to start to associate all the things that you want to do and the things that you quote unquote need to do. It's going to be like, I don't like that. I get nothing out of it. So every time we celebrate and we do something that's fun and exciting, we're teaching our brain to enjoy the process, right? They always say there's all kinds of personal development people that will say it's, it's not the destination, it's the journey, 
right? I believe in both, right? I believe you need to have the destination to really pull you along, like that vacation that you want to take, or maybe it's that degree that you're working on and then you're going to school, right? That's the destination. But the process along the way needs to be enjoyable too. And how do we make it enjoyable? We celebrate. We just celebrate all the time, right? So I teach my clients to build a list of, I don't know why I did that. It's a list on there as a list. Um, but list out, you know, 10 to 15 different ways that you could celebrate things from small celebrations to big ones. Like when you achieve the big goals, you could take yourself out to dinner or like if it's, if it's your career and you hit that big milestone, then you can go on vacation or whatever it is. But we want small ways to celebrate too. For me, since I work from home, I used to be in the restaurant industry for 30 plus years. I do not like sitting in this chair. So I reward myself after I, if I've got to do a bunch of work on here, I'll let myself just get up and walk around for five minutes and do nothing. Oftentimes it's too hot to go outside right now, but a lot of times I've got a park. It's like right behind us. Uh, and I just go sit and I just relax, listen to the sounds of the park. And it's very soothing and relaxing for me. My brain likes it. Right. And I always picture like every time we do something, when we're celebrating something that's fun and exciting, it's these shots of dopamine that are going to our brain. Like when you eat something sweet, like chocolate or whatever, like that, it's like, ooh, I picture fireworks just like going off in my head. So when I'm doing these celebrations, I'm doing the same thing. I'm like just picturing, I'm allowing myself to feel the joy and the happiness. And I'm picturing just fireworks. Like you could do something as simple as just high five yourself. Mel Robbins wrote a book called The High Five Habit, where she has yourself high five yourself in the mirror. And if that gives you the dopamine rush, then so be it. Like there's sometimes that I just go, oh, hell yeah. I mean, I say other things, but right now for you, hell yeah, right? And so that gives me a shot of dopamine. And that works in, in some other situations. Another celebration that I like to use is one of the things I used to do when I was procrastinating all the time was I would get on my iPad and I would play. There was I love to do puzzles on there because it's it, I'm not thinking my anxiety lowers and stuff and I'm just puzzling. And and that's actually another way of exercising your brain too as well. But there was a Star Wars game on there that I would like to play, but I would end up playing those for a long time and guilt would take over. So what I do now is after I do like a, a you know, a couple of time blocks uh, where I work, a couple of 45 minute um, sessions. So I've worked 90 minutes or two hours. I will set a timer and I will allow myself to just play 15 minutes of just guilt free time. And it's actually fun because there's, I'm like, I'm not worried that I'm not doing something that I should be doing. So I just enjoy playing. So these are the ways that we celebrate. But now that you've associated the process and the journey, with celebration and fun, it, it becomes fun. In fact, like I got to the point where one of my ways of celebrating, and I kid you not, this, this just amazed me. One of my ways of celebrating is doing something else on my list. Because every time I do something on my list, I get excited. I'm like, yeah, that's another thing, right? And so then I'll be like, oh, just because I've got like uh, household, daily household stuff. I've got my business stuff that I do. I've got personal stuff. Uh, like visualization and exercise, but then I've also got the daily stuff, like give the cats a snack or whatever like that. So then I'm like, oh, I've got some time here. I'm going to take 15 minutes and I'm going to go do some of these other things because not only do, do I get excited that I do them, they're, I don't have to worry about them. I get them done, right? So that's just the way they do it. So now we've gone through awareness and celebrations. We're going to move on to self-compassion. And I'm going to pause again just to see if anybody's got any questions. <clears throat> We've got a quiet crowd today. No worries. So self-compassion. What does self-compassion have to do with, like, with the mental muscle? Well, one of the things that I was, when I was reading, it was one of the top 10 books on reasons why we procrastinate is because of self-compassion or lack of self-compassion. Kristen Neff wrote a book um, on self-compassion. I don't know exactly what the title is. I think it's just self-compassion. Um, but it's basically, we're more likely to follow through and do something uh, or continue doing something if we're compassionate with ourselves than versus when we're hard on ourselves. I always tell people that the most important conversation and the most important relationship you can have is the relationship and the conversation you have with yourself. And what do I mean by that? 
is how do you talk to yourself? Like if you're going through your daily thing and you fail at something or whatever, how do you talk to yourself? Like, what are you saying? Are you saying mean things? Are you saying nice things? And the best way to kind of get a picture of this is I want you to think of a parent and a child. And the parent, the kids hasn't cleaned his room, uh, hasn't put away his toys, everything's mess. And the parent is over here just yelling at that kid. You're a slob. You need to clean your room. You know, it's like a pigsty in here. How could you do this? Stuff like that, right? Well, how would you feel as the kid? Like picture, I just want you to picture yourself and visualize yourself, that kid in that situation with your parent yelling. Maybe your parents did that, right? Um, it doesn't feel good. But in this case, you're the parent and you're the child. Like you've got that evil voice on one shoulder, the good voice over here, only the evil voice is, is the one doing most of the talking or the bad voice or whatever you want to call it, right? And, and it's just, you know, just saying these condescending things to yourself and it doesn't make you want to follow through. It makes you feel crappy. And I would rather create a conversation with myself, like change that voice in my head that's talking to me that's a reassuring voice, that's a, a reassuring conversation. Instead of saying, Brian, you suck. You're never going to figure this out. You're never going to amount to anything. You're never going to succeed. You've been at this for X amount of years and you're still blah, blah, blah. I've changed that conversation to where it's, I got you, Brian. Let's, let's do this. Yep, sure, we failed. Chalk up one more failure. Like Edison would say that I've just figured out one more way to, to not get a light bulb lit, right? But he continued along. That allowed him to continue on. So the more compassionate we are with ourselves, that relationship, when that relationship with yourself becomes better, that changes your whole self-concept and the way you look at yourself, right? So the ways that you could do the self-compassion is when those alarms and when those reminders are going off, just become aware of how you talk to yourself. And then you could start to change the conversation you have with yourself. Uh, I do it out loud. I talk out loud all the time since it's nobody here but me and the cats right now. I would just start to, to say, no, 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 Brian. That, that thought that you just had that you're not good enough is not true. And here's the evidence that I have for it. You've done this. You, you had a restaurant for 10 years. You're a restaurant tours of the year. You did this and you did A, B, and C. You, you know, and did all this stuff. And I remind myself of all the good things, which lifts me up. So that's the uh, third muscle. Uh, the fourth muscle is the promise muscle. And uh, this had to do for me with your confidence. So how did I build confidence? And remember, if you look up uh, mental muscles on the internet, it'll say that confidence is one of them. But I was like, well, how do you build up confidence? And so confidence all has to do with your self-esteem. Like, how do you view yourself? Like, how do you even see yourself? And if you're interested, I did a whole one of these uh, uh, paid forward talks on self-esteem and how to build your self-esteem. And you can go in there and that'll completely teach you how to exercise uh, and build your self-esteem. But right now, what I do to exercise the promise muscle is I think of, think of your, uh, your self-esteem as like a credit score that you have with yourself. Uh, and just like you've got a financial credit score and the higher it is, the, the better your opportunities are for taking out loans and, and people doing business with you. The higher your credit score is with yourself, the more confidence you have, the more um, you're willing to do things when you're not feeling like it or you're not motivated or the willpower is not there, right? How do we build that credit score? Every promise that we keep to ourselves, big or small, that credit score goes up. And every time we promise ourselves to do something, the credit score goes down. That's why you say, when you say, oh, I'm gonna, I'm, I'll start tomorrow. I'm gonna start tomorrow. I'm just gonna take this weekend. I'm gonna start Monday. And you don't follow through, cha ching that credit score goes down. So how do we build the, the promise muscle? How do we build the confidence up? Is what I do is I set intentions for the day I have my clients set intentions, like what their intentions are, and we just start tiny. We just start doing things that we know that we can follow through and keep our promises with the sole intention of just building our confidence within ourselves. Because the higher the confidence, like think about it, when you feel really good about yourself, you're like, you'll just start, you'll just do anything. Like you'll, you go, oh yeah, that project, no big deal, let me tackle it. It's when you don't feel good about yourself and you haven't been keeping your promises, that you don't follow through and you don't want to do that. 
So we do simple things like if it's when it comes to exercising, I might keep a small promise to myself of just doing uh, five push-ups, five sit-ups, and five squats each day, and I'll do that each morning. But at the end of the week, after you've done it for a week and celebrated, don't forget celebrating, all of a sudden you feel better about yourself. When you feel better about yourself, you start doing more, and then you can just start adding more. But <clears throat> back to those intentions. So whatever your intentions you're setting for the day, you could use those alarms and those reminders and your awareness muscle, am I following through with this? So when that alarm goes off, let's say it's a, a, a noon alarm for me, I can go, well, between the last alarm and now, did I have any opportunities to keep one of my promises to myself? And if the answer is I did and I didn't do it, then I use that self-compassion muscle to tell myself that it's okay, I'm human. Remember, 95% of my thoughts are on this habit loop, so that's okay, right? I'll forgive myself, I do that. And then I say, what can I do in the moment that I'm in? And then I set that intention, I keep it, but I can also look ahead to the afternoon and say, what are gonna be some opportunities that I have some promises that I can keep to myself? So that's the fourth muscle today is the promise one. And like I said, these are all the foundation. If you could get these five muscles that I'm sharing with you today and just work those out and exercise them over the next few weeks, uh, when I come out with the next uh, set uh, next month, you're going to be in a prime position to just catapult. So the very last muscle is, is the evaluation muscle. And like Brian, once again, like I just said, I'm taking concepts and I'm picturing them as a mental muscle, right? So how do we improve? They say one of the formulas for success is that you set a plan, you execute the plan, and then you evaluate. Uh, and in this case, you're just going to ask yourself evaluations of what worked. What am I doing that's working? What am I doing that's not working? What can I do differently? And then you take what, what's working, what can I do differently? And you put those two together and that's your new game plan. That's how the evaluation process works. And so I recommend to people that just once a day at the end of your day, just start with like a five minute evaluation. And in order to build this up, um, we, like if you're evaluating your business or you're evaluating your study habits or you're evaluating uh, whatever it is, like your your uh, if you're trying to be healthier, if you're trying to evaluate that, sometimes it's difficult to come up with like what did I do well? Because your brain hasn't thought about it. Like it doesn't. It's it's not used to thinking what I did. It's used to thinking I know what I did wrong, right? That's why we start off with what worked. What was I doing that's working? Because if you start off with what, uh, what wasn't working, your brain's gonna be like, well, you only did, uh, you were supposed to do 50 push-ups today and you only did 25. And I'm just gonna get down on myself. And so when it comes time to figuring out what worked, I'm not actually going to, to think of as many things. So the first thing you do is you just say what worked. Like you can evaluate frying an egg. Like, did I heat up the pan? Was the pan hot enough? Uh, did I have enough butter in the pot or oil in the bottom of the pan when I cracked the egg in there? Did the, the yolk break? How did I flip it? Did, did that process work when I, moved my, when I moved the pan over this way and leaned it? Did that work? We can evaluate anything. Like you can evaluate things. When you start to evaluate, I always say this, like here is your, your, your bottom right now where you're at. Here's where you're at. Every evaluation you do, you take a step up. So we're no longer down here at this level because we evaluate what works. So I'm gonna continue doing what worked and now I'm up here, right? And then you can say what didn't work and either change it or get rid of it. And you can say, what can I do differently? And you can add something in. So change what wasn't working, you either change it or get rid of it. And then what would I do differently? And you try that. So that first step we took up right here now. And then after we take that step and we implement it, Maybe it's just a, something we do for a day or a week or whatever, but then we evaluate that what worked and we keep that and then we go on. So we're constantly taking steps up. And that's how you, you do mark improvement because not all your days are just gonna be the straight line of going up. You're gonna have failures and stuff like that. But if you don't learn how to evaluate them, like I don't think of this failure as a bad thing. In fact, I think of failure, like I've ch changed my whole uh, outlook on failure, like failure is a necessity 
Like I want to fail because every time I fail, I get to learn from it. And when I learn from it, I take a step up and then I take another step up. So I kind of look forward to failing in a way. I know that's kind of a weird thing. There's a book out there called Failing Forward by, I think it's by John C. Maxwell. I told you I read a ton of books on there. So that's what we want to do. So at the end of your day, <clears throat> you could just evaluate what today went well. And in this beginning, when you're doing these exercises in these mental muscles, I always tell people, evaluate your awareness. Like, did I even set the alarms today? Did I even pause? Like you're evaluating, like the first day goes by, and you're like, oh, crap. I didn't even pause. I didn't even do the alarms that, that Brian was talking about. That could be your evaluation. Like what worked? Well, you know, my day... You know, when I paused, uh, I noticed this, or I noticed that, or I did this. I noticed that when I think this thought, uh, I feel this way. So now I know that when I'm feeling this way, it has to do with these certain thoughts. You can write all these things on what worked and then what didn't work. Well, I forgot to set the alarms or uh, A, B, and C, and then what can I do differently? And just spend five minutes on doing it. Don't make it a long time. In the very beginning, I promise you, your brain's going to have trouble coming up with things that worked really well. Now my brain, since I do this all the time, I find the tiniest of little things that I did well and little minor things that I could do differently to, to tweak them and the stuff like that. But that all comes with exercise and the muscle. Every single one of these, you're not gonna be doing it well at first. I promise you that. Like everything, like when you learn to ride a bike at first, it did not go well. That's why you had the training wheels on there. That's why your mom was, was sitting on there. But eventually you were riding around. Like think about going to the gym. And I know the majority of people in here know what exercising it is. When you first go to do something, it's hard. Like it's a struggle. You can't just go run a marathon, right? You have to start exercising first. You have to maybe, even before you even start running, maybe the, the first exercise you do is just stretching and then now you're stretched to the point where i could i could run around the block and then now that i've run around the block i could do that that's what we're doing with all of these muscles the awareness muscle the celebration muscle the self-compassion the promises and the evaluations we're just every day just just exercising it a little bit so that's it uh, that's what I had for you today uh, on your awareness muscles. And I want you to think again of that behavioral loop and how these muscles can crack and get you inside that. The behavioral loop works as follows. We have our circumstances, whatever our environment around us. We've got things coming in, all these things uh, uh, coming in at our senses, and that creates a thought. From that thought, we have a feeling which makes us take some sort of action, and that's where we get our results. So it's really our thoughts that are creating our results. And I need to exercise my mental muscles so I can break into that behavioral loop and I can take control because 95% of our day, we're just running on default programming that we've programmed ourselves to do over uh, decades and decades. Or if you're you know, one of the young ones in there in the youth educational scholarship, think of the last 15 plus years that you've just trained yourself to think a certain way or whatever. And that's what we're doing. So I want to pause again and see if there are any questions. All right, really quiet crowd today. No big deal. <laughs> I promise you that if you take these things and you, um, you utilize them, you will strengthen your muscle, mental muscles uh, and your ability to create an empowering new life, ability to get better results and to stop self-sabotaging self yourself is going to change. I promise you that. And it just starts with these simple, basic muscles. Now we're going to progress as we go along in here to some of the uh, different, more, uh, not even difficult muscles, but just some more complex muscles that we can work out. Uh, think of like your, your basic set, like right now we're just doing push-ups and sit-ups and squats. But later on, we're going to do like some of the, the trapezoid or I don't even know the muscle names. It's too funny. But anyway, we're going to do some of these more difficult workout routines or whatever. They're going to exercise some of the, the finer muscles in there. So anyway, that was it. 
Uh, once again, my name is Brian Peterson. I am a life coach with Achieve, Grow, Succeed Coaching. I help people create exercise programs for their minds where I help them uninstall their limiting beliefs and stop their self-sabotaging ways so that they can create success and they get the results that they're looking. I call it installing a success system of thinking today or uh, installing a success system of thinking instead, right? And that's what we were doing today. So um, uh, once again, this was brought to you by the Life Coach University and their Pay It Forward platform where coaches from around the world have gathered to coach millions more. That's what their, excuse me, that's what their mission is. And uh, all we want you to do is join us and paying it for. We just want to create the biggest ripple effect of gift giving the world has ever seen. And it all starts with each and every one of you and us in our own homes, in our own communities. You could uh, use this coaching to pay it forward to yourself. You could teach it to somebody. You could share this opportunity with somebody. You could buy somebody lunch, hug somebody, say something nice to somebody, Make somebody laugh. That's my favorite. That was my go-to one as always. We don't care how you do it. Just joining us and making this the type of world that we want to live in, which is one filled with more peace, joy, love, and meaningful connection. And one more shout out to the YES program, uh, the Youth Educational Scholarship Program. Uh, once again, we're currently on summer holiday. I'm going to give a shout out to all uh, on behalf of Life Coach University, everybody that's been through it right now and got your certifications, congratulations, you're amazing. Uh, keep going at it. Uh, we start up again in September and the only requirement is that you watch one hour of video a week. Uh, right now, you can actually go back into the archives if you, if you log on to lifecoachuniversity.com and there's all kinds of videos to watch. This one, I don't know how long it'll take to process, but it will be in there. Uh, <clears throat> I've got ones on habit. There's so many coaches out there that are doing wonderful things. These are coaches from around the world just sharing their gift with you. It's amazing. Who is the YES scholarship for? The Youth Educational Scholarship is for 19 to 25 year olds. Uh, it's free. That's why I tell them it's free. So take advantage of it. The best investment you can make is the investment in yourself. And this is by reading, by uh, becoming healthier, and also educating yourself, right? Uh, it's a scholarship. There's no application. All you have to do is email the office at hello at lifecoachuniversity.com. That's hello at lifecoachuniversity.com. And say that you're interested in the scholarship. It'll get you all the information you need to get going on that. We start up again in late December. Uh, and that's it. Thank you so much for being in here. I just want to honor you again. You are amazing. Uh, if you were on this call today, uh, you're amazing. If you're coming on the call from a later time, you're amazing too. Have a wonderful, absolutely amazing day. I love you all. Bye-bye.